is an ongoing sati, a sati in Buddhism, and the process is is remember process in itself. You know, remember time is is this uh, kind of ongoing remembering of of impermanence, and sati as such is impermanent. And then the other part is, I love to propose that never forget art. I think that a lot of the Buddhist world and in contemporary Buddhist world have almost dismissed artistic expressions of non-valuable or something that is this kind of papancha of the mind, you know, mostly in the... So then I love the possibility of of embracing um, the ongoing word that is creativity, but it's literally this pulsating thing that is changing, that happened to be organized in a certain way. For example, in Sati, you can go in the lower part and one of the links, there is a project that is called Remember This. And it's literally uh, a, a, a separate little app that reminds you of impermanence in words, which like ChatGPT is called, and create this little poem in English and, and Pali. And then the, the also creates an image. And of course, an image is just a gift. So, and I feel that that's what I hope that we never forget. Welcome back to the Sounds of Sand podcast. My name is Michael Riley, and I'm delighted today to share a conversation I had with an artist and researcher named Marlon Barrios Solano. And I met Marlon at an artist residency in Berlin of dancers and choreographers, musicians and artists. And Marlon was leading a daily meditation group. And we got into talking every day and found ourselves having really great conversations around our mutual interests in Buddhism, art, and science. So I thought he'd be a great guest to introduce here to the Sand community. And we discussed a lot of things from Marlon's background in philosophy as an artist and meditation teacher, but specifically the role of AI in spiritual teaching. And Marlon is the creator of a Buddhist AI chatbot called Sati AI. And we'll have links to Sati AI in the show notes so you can explore and interact with this artificially intelligent Buddhist monk, as Marlon describes it or head over to sati-ai.app. So let's get into it. Marlon Barrio Solano is an internationally recognized interdisciplinary artist and teacher specializing in software engineering, generative AI, dance, improvisation, and mindfulness. His diverse work, ranging from AI-driven apps to digital therapeutics, manifests in web applications, interactive installations, multimedia performances, education, and consulting. So excited to welcome Marlon to the Sounds of Sand podcast, presented by Science and Non-Duality. Welcome to Science and Non-Duality. What is non-duality? The universal forces. It's the collective conscious being aware. Trauma is not the external event that happens. Trauma is the impact of that event, which is the disconnection from ourselves. That matter is energy. Energy is matter. That's what EMC squared is about. There's a language without nouns. There is a language without subjugation. There's a language without objectifying. But if it's recorded, then we there is a collapse. But if it's not, then it's the infinite potentiality. All right. I'm here with Marlon Barros Solano. Thanks for being on the Sounds of Sand podcast. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Yeah. This will, will be a, we've, we spent the week together sharing space here at Lake Studios Berlin. And uh, you've been leading these meditation classes every morning, which have been really great for me to connect, connect with you and kind of hear your voice and hear yeah. your, the way you weave the Dhamma with science and art and yeah. All of these huh. things, so it's been really beautiful, and we've had great conversations <laughs> so far. So, yeah. it's the a whole month. catastrophe. I would call it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, uh, the whole catastrophe. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, I guess as a way to orient people before we get into the specific projects, mm-hmm. like Sati AI and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did you get into meditation? I was living in New York. I moved to New York, and I am originally from Venezuela, and I moved to New York in 1994 to dance. I danced with 
professionally with some companies. And uh, I think it was a byproduct of the New York experience as well, you know, because I was working with two projects and when one of the projects was extremely uh, working with very, very uh, deep and and harsh imagery. So I actually almost started having panic attacks when I was going to, the, in the subway, going to rehearsals. So the same choreographer, she said, you know, there is uh, this thing called uh, meditation. And, and I knew about it, but never practiced it formally. And, and in the time, I was also, I had a boyfriend who had gone to Naropa. And so he knew um, a teacher in the village Zendo in New York, uh, Pat Enkyo O'Hara, and uh, this uh, really amazing teacher, and it also was in the village. In, uh, um, so then that became the beginning of, of practicing within the framework of uh, Buddhist meditation. This was Zen, the village Zendo. And then, yes, that's how, that's how it started. And in the 97, then we took what's called the Jukai, the, when you commit to be a practitioner. But that was like really interesting for me because I was dancing and I was performing a lot. And so then it, it really became almost like a way of bearing or, or even, kind of, yeah, let go a lot of the imagery that I was working with. So it became this, okay, let's just cleanse my palate in a way. Because, and my teacher, uh, Enkyo, in that time, she recognized that, that you know, I was not forced <laughs> to wear a robes or anything like that. I was like, do however you want to do it. So that was very nice. So, yeah, that's how I started. Then I, like, probably in 2007, I started going to Inside Meditation Society in Massachusetts. Um, yeah, and then that's how I kind of transition from Zen to uh, the more the insight meditation or, or, or kind of more based in what we understand now as mindfulness practice. Um, and the retreat format that it has a very specific uh, design in relationship to what, uh, how it's presented to the practitioner. Yeah, so that's kind of, and we mean, we, meanwhile it was... Uh, continuing my artistic exploration. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, so more or less, that's how I started. And, and then many things have happened since then. <laughs> yeah. And so this, <clears throat> this connection or this mm -hmm. e exploration of, mm -hmm. of Zen and meditation, mm -hmm. did you feel it mm -hmm. infused into your work as a, as a dancer and an artist? Or did it feel like, yeah. okay, this is kind of my a way for me to, to check out of what I'm doing artistically. Hmm. Interesting. In the beginning was actually, uh, is when your head is on fire, right? So I think that it was more of this personal practice to um, understand my own suffering and or, or do something <laughs> about it that was, I think, probably felt as anxiety or this uh, floating thing and that I was feeling. Uh, then, always Zen and Buddhism has been epistemically interesting for me in relationship to the philosophical part and all that. Um, but it has been a progressive merging, probably, in relationship to um, what 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 it means and uh going back a little bit to in, in my own professional development i actually have a degree in psychology and cognitive science so then i always feel that yeah there's a kind of different whatever i'm doing and different instantiations of trying to investigate the notions and the experience of 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 being this being a human or having this kind of knowing uh, and I think that there, there had been very specific influences in my work. Um, and then probably with the time and the aging, <laughs> I've been uh, enjoying the benefits of integrating, <laughs> integrating things. Uh, not necessarily is the most practical or, or is, a, you know, in any case, a direct path 
of of integration. But I feel, yeah, the the question has remained the same for for a really long, and so I feel like it's you know definitely was an urgency that was my own suffering in relationship to what I was feeling every day. And then I start kind of to feel the benefits of in my personal life of an ongoing practice. Um, and then it became more obvious when I was going on retreats. Yeah. So, and then I think in 2014, I started, um, I wanted to, to integrate this in my practices. As you may know, uh, in the artistic world, we actually have that word practice floating around yeah. in relationship to creating and doing your research. That is, if it, I found it really interesting that we also call it research practice. Uh, this, this two words together. And then we have something that, that we create this uh, array of tools and things that we do to... Uh, yeah, uh, kind of filter our everyday reality. <laughs> and, and so then I felt that, oh, this can be so interesting as part of my questions. What is this? What, what is consciousness? And, um, and, and included then progressively in the things that I also can offer to the world as, as an artist. And I definitely believe that the practices of mindfulness or a lot of this consciousness practices or contemplative practices are a craft, are an art, actually. They're not a science of the mind or anything like that. For me, it's, a, it's a, something that uh, is, is this ongoing craft that deals with uh, the shape, shaping and structuring our, our own subjectivity. So... Yeah, so in a way that became part of, of the process. It's okay, what is my own practice? And then uh, I did the Community Dharma Leaders Program in Spirit Rock from 2014 to 2017. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, so that was a very rich, nuanced experience. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then the idea of the program what I love, it was not, okay, you will become a teacher, but definitely they certify you as a teacher for certain the, uh, formats. But it was more my own investigation of how the different teachings of the many dharmas can be embodied in my own everyday life and my practice of my art or as a, a person who I love to facilitate context of, of research. Of, of research in the arts and technology field. So that's where I start in, in kind of uh, uh, adding mindfulness or sitting practice. There's like, I was not like teaching in, in the formal, you know, Dharma world. <laughs> it was more of like, then let's do this underground meditation now in an art and technology mm -hmm. uh, course or, or special think tank, etc. Yeah. Yeah, I like this f framing of, well, this importance of the word practice, too. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think, you know, I'm, I'm coming from a music world, and I often uh -huh. tell people that's that's what meditation is. It's practice yeah. for the real world. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you're sitting at the piano playing scales uh -huh. in a very controlled, with the metronome, yeah. in a very kind of, uh, yeah. uh, I guess, aesthetic, not, no, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, in a very controlled kind of... Uh -huh environment so that when you interface with other musicians yeah. you have that that skill kind of embodied and yeah. that's kind of i think what meditation that's yeah. the when the fruits of meditation ripen it's when we're able to be in relation yeah. with other people and and have that same level of presence and calm that we mm -hmm. can cultivate in mm -hmm. silence sitting on a cushion yeah like it reminds me of what even i said this morning in the session yes. that you know, we are not meditating for the meditation in itself. Yeah. <laughs> it's not about becoming a great meditator. It's about, in, at least in this frame, right. that in the insight meditation framework or the early Buddhist framework, there is this beautiful model of sila, samadhi, and panya. You know, sila is the ethics, samadhi is the cultivations of 
practices that may generate wisdom. Yeah. So Panya is the wisdom that hopefully is such a big word, but I think is this is contextual. Is this thing, okay, what is needed now? What is needed? What is needed? In relation to relief suffering, your own suffering or suffering of others. So so then in a, in that sense and and I think I probably sometimes I'd become a little bit more <laughs> reckless about the non separation between or the non dual part of practice and real life, you know, that is a that's a fiction. Yeah. You know, that there is no such a thing of what is real or not real about life. So so then it's definitely a device, it's another <laughs> performative context in which we suggest a bunch of scores or rules and and then hopefully that becomes some kind of memory trans you know transposition then then can transpose whatever is there and even recondition our nervous system in relationship to how we are um, in this everyday life but uh, and that I think is because I've been teaching mostly non-retreat contexts, mm -hmm. so that had been very interesting because it's literally just this is is this ongoing contextualization of a body doing something. <laughs> yeah. So then it's reminding yourself that it's like okay, there's this body doing things and activity. So instead of creating this specialized context of okay, this is it separate it's it, your practice is separate from your real life or whatever we think real life is and it may be useful yes yet i how my teaching has been evolving contextually is is, is in this almost flowy permeable way and then my question is what if you know what if there is no separation between that there's again another duality created by our conceptual minds and yeah traditions and etc so yeah 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 i love that well you know often in meditation sessions it's ended with a bell <laughs> and it reminds me i guess you know we learn bells in, in school yeah. and it's like you go to the next period yeah. <laughs> um so it's like not you're not ending your meditation mm. session. It's the bell rings, and now mm. we're going to go into this next thing, whether yeah. it's the conversation in the Dharma yeah. circle or yeah. going out into the real world. The yeah. meditation continues. It's yeah. just in a different period. <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, I use a lot of these devices of calling it sati, you know, that that instead of, you know, that's one thing that I, I'm really liking to bring the Pali language mostly as a space of creating a world of imagination, you know, it's like, because, you know, it's not the language that we speak. So then it's there and I use kind of the etymological origins of the world to recompose what we think, like, okay, sati, misnomer, mistranslated as mindfulness. So not only is a mistranslation, it also carries a split between mind-body. So then it's like a lot of things are there. And I think that that's, uh, that's one of the things that I really kind of like to use then language to, to bring spaces for, for, for imagination and dislocate our, all, our notions, you know, that, or dislocate them for relocating uh, a different, I'm going to use a bit more like epistemological frame. Because one of the main problems is like we keep uh, perpetuating the epistemic frameworks that had are problematic in relationship to mind body that's the problem with mindfulness for example yeah. it's like okay making what this mind full is a body full of mind so then it already creates a hierarchy that is like fully top down so and it's totally actually is not neurophysiologically correct yeah <laughs> so, it's like we have yeah. these yeah. you know this society wide suffering mm -hmm. of thinking too much and mm -hmm. being stuck in our thoughts and we're like let's add more mindfulness let's yeah. fill it up with more mind fill yeah. it up with more mind yeah. and yeah that's 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 why i love about yeah. our meeting and and speaking yeah. is like you said this embracing of of the poly and mm -hmm. this you know the 
from what I perceive a little bit of like a a moving away from this, like the secular Buddhist Mm -hmm. mindfulness thing that's kind of culturally, it was pretty culturally active. And I think it still is kind of like corporate mindfulness and using Mm -hmm. it as a self-help productivity tool. Yeah, no, it's really interesting because, you know, I am extremely, you know, I'm a materialist in the way that I think about, I kind of, my frame is come from, understanding the materiality of, of, of the world and in trying to understand it from a science perspective. And, uh, but probably the artistic background, I'm very sensitive because of my background, I'm very sensitive to the power of how language constructs realities. And, uh, and also I'm aware of the narratives of science and I'm aware how, of course, Buddhism has legitimated itself through science, <laughs> you know, as, is, as if it is the science of the mind, which is a contradiction, it, it's impossible. Yeah. So, so then there is, because we are subjective creatures and then we need methodologies in order to, to create science, but that's not even guaranteed guaranteed objectivity is just a method so so there are things that i try to recognize that when i am proposing this practice that okay come from a lineage and that i think is very respectful in other words ongoing appropriations of 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 of, uh, cultural appropriations of practices so then it's like, you know, when you talk about the bell, it's like, what will happen if I bring a drum? <laughs> you know? And it's the same in the Buddhist context, meaning in the context of emptiness that is proposed in a lot of the kind of more kind of later Buddhism, the bell is exactly like the drum. But the drum is for us, it has some kind of primitivism embedded <laughs> culturally. And then because it's nicer to have the bell. And then the, the drum is related probably even with voodoo. Yeah. So it's like the space between Buddhism and voodoo is what we construct culturally. Yeah. So I then I think that there is, especially now, to, to bring that uh, kind of epistemic cleansing and, and clarity that, that this, you know, this stuff is constructed. It's a bell is not better than... Yeah. The sound of, of literally a uh, uh, stomach noise from the person next door friend, or is sitting next to you. So Yeah, it's just a reminder to be present. Yeah, or yeah. that it's exactly the same rolling phenomenon, you know? Yeah, and we have so many bells yeah. in our culture. So yeah. every time you hear a, a <laughs> ding of a notification or, yeah. you yeah. know, an alarm yeah. or all these sounds, they're just yeah. bells to come back to the present moment. Yeah. <laughs> But also, I think we are conditioned to make things sacred. Yeah. You know? Well, to, and, to, uh, to other, so. it's another form of othering. Yeah. It's like this, my yeah. normal job, yeah. my family, this is, that's yeah. the mundane. Yeah. But when I sit on the cushion and yeah. the bell rings and I'm yeah. listening to my guided meditation, yeah. then I'm in the, the realm of the sacred. Yeah. So it's another. And it's a really enormous privilege in the, in the, in the beautiful part of the world and also the loaded term of in relationship to the privilege of creating a sacred space. Yeah. So, um, or how much can I purchase stuff to have a bell and to have this, to have that, to creating the cushion and the safu and the sabuton and yada, yada. So I think that that is, yeah, that is very important in, in what I've been coming to realize that probably it's important to to push or to pull, <laughs> you know, in our ongoing awareness of that, how we, we construct and, and then how much we start craving from, okay, all those things that looks Buddhist or they, you know, for creating another umbrella for, or canopy for ourselves. Mm-hmm. So it has been very important for me, the, the teachings of uh, uh, Stephen Batchelor. It, that even I think he was one of the ones who coined secular Buddhism in itself. But what it was really amazing about starting with him is how he welcomed a quality of my own being in the world, that, that it was this strange breed of artist that we deconstruct stuff, that, <laughs> that we have this almost uh, uh, philosophical activism <laughs> and being in the world in a 
in a way that connecting that we connect a lot of dots, for example, my own interdisciplinarity. And that's not, that was not wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I was thinking too much. Mm -hmm. So, and I learned to recognize that in my own practice. Okay, there is thinking, but not to obliterate my own, probably intelligence or, or capacities to, to see beyond what is presented to me and with some kind of a skepticism. the word sacred a few minutes ago yeah. so did you find your own work having this resonance of being sacred mm. once it once it once you started mm. let the division between your yeah. practice in buddhism mm. and your artist practice well that's an interesting you know i don't like to think that way i don't like to find myself tapping into some you know of course i some realm of of a spirituality you know i really feel that oh, that's also Calling Buddhism and a spirit practice, spiritual practice is like, I don't know, call them pasta dessert or something like that. Because it is, um, you know, culturally, probably we like it, but it's, there is no spirit really in, in this practice. There is anatta. So there is nothing that continues. So at least in the, there, there are many debates, you know, through the 2,500 years. So... Yeah, no, I think that that's kind of important. Tell me again, what was it? Was something about yeah. about the word sacred? Yes, if you feel if you feel so, that your work is sacred. Yeah, I think that there is something beautiful that ha there is. I, I I like to create to think that there is something about that feels beautiful, mm -hmm. and I need to care about. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that the the creating something sacred or what we think is sacred that is almost related with the world secret, you know, it's just like this, this space that I want to care about, this space that I, uh, this person that I care about, this heart that I care about. So, so then I have found myself feeling and sensing in my body the, the resonance of blessings, for example. I would never thought that that <laughs> I would have never thought that I was going to be in a position of power that I think is when you're sitting in front of from one to you know any number of people that their heart minds are there being vulnerable or resonating with you in whatever direction you take them and priming an experience because that's what I think that we do <laughs> as teachers we're priming some kind of knowledge so then Suddenly, when we practice this uh, meta practice at the end of, and I love to do it at the end, this expansive field of goodness or benefaction, it feels like creating a blessings. So, and I call it a soft blessing. It's kind of this well wishing that is, that I can hold without pushing away what is actually happening. Mm -hmm. That's what I think is really important that. Creating a sacred space is not a different space. Right. And I hopefully can hold my knowing that it's an artifact of my own mind heart. Yeah, yeah that is going to change. That there are ants and microbes and, and you know, <laughs> stuff that, that even stuff that we don't even know. So I hope it holds that, you know, the, that possibility of knowing that is bigger but it's not hopefully to create a, a protective shield of privilege or something like that. Yeah. 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 yeah this word knowing. So mm -hmm. I think, I feel like this can be a, <clears throat> um, a holographic portal into, mm -hmm. into Sati and AI and this work. Mm -hmm. um, so in these um, mm -hmm. morning sessions I've been with mm -hmm. you, you've, you've uh, touched into this word sati and mm -hmm. sort of explored its realms. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, could you expand that word, that mm -hmm. 
that Polly word a bit more for us. Thank you. Yeah, what I know is is uh, it was this mis- mistranslation uh, one the the one for mindfulness, and the other in relationship to meditation. You know, this ongoing. And meditation also comes from the Latin meditatio, you know, contemplatio and meditatio that are kind of Christian <clears throat> methods, <laughs> right? So, and it's, ma- it's mainly different because um, there is, uh, I think there is more a prescriptive aspect in meditation, in, in what we understand as sati or what is presented. I think that there is this is literally do this, <laughs> remember. It's like remember, and you literally remember the the uh, the three characteristics of 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 uh, existence in in Buddhism. That is, you know, anatta, dukkha, and anicca. That is the the non separatedness of ourselves of the self, the possibility of relating with the stress and dukkha or existing, just existing and change. And and the and then of course the impermanence of or the ongoing change of this. And we, and what would tendency to get hooked there. So then sati for me it, it is uh, when when the in the Pali canon was presented is is this ongoing instructions. That, or there's instructions for the practitioner uh, and then clearly says that it's done during the whole day or in any activity. And also that the practitioner remembers is in, in sati as this ongoing process of relating with whatever we think the experience is. And of course, even we have those words separating experience from expression of life, you know, and, and that is in the Pali Canon is not that way. It's literally sati is being in performance, is is being in the form. So there is no mind body separate. There is, you know, is this uh, heart mind embodied activity going around. So so then, you know, of course, there is sati uh, that I, through actually doing several projects, some of them including technology, I trying to understand, you know, and I, and I love art because it gives me a lot of freedom to, <laughs> to speculate and I take it very seriously, but I have the, hopefully the advantage that I am not taking very seriously <laughs> because I'm an artist. So then, so then that gives me some freedom to, to not having a lot of fear of praise and blame and things like that. Yeah. Even if that happens. Yeah. Yeah. And so you use this phrase in our sessions in the morning of of the body knowing the body Mm -hmm. and it's almost Mm -hmm. from what i'm hearing you say sati is is remembering to remember Mm -hmm. it's that that part of us that recognizes that we're in a flow of experience and we have a you know we're we're learning things from the past and those things from the past want to know what's present so it's the remembering to remember yeah and that may sound uh paradoxical or oxymoronic or just in relationship to to what we like to think, right? So how we construct a thinking body, for example. Um, but I, I really have been playing a lot with, probably because of my background in dance as well, that what would be if we, how, what if we re-choreograph this? What if we 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 move thoughts to the place of movement and we think about reverting the thoughts to uh, some kind of form, you know, or whatever we think thought is, is some kind of forming that it actually is. You know, literally, we, we like to think thoughts are this kind of immaterial, ephemeral thing, mm-hmm. but it's actually a f- physical neurological pattern mm-hmm. that is happening in real time right now for me to be able to say these words that I'm forming a sound also they have to be matched Mm -hmm. (laughs) for a certain neurological pattern of my neurons have to be firing in a certain way even to be able to understand what we're talking here and recognize the context and to having this posture and 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 my hair is growing and all that is 
this ongoing process that simultaneously is happening, simultaneously is happening. So, so then, you know, I think that that is, it, that has been very important for me to experiment with different kind of uh, almost poetics, uh, certain kind of poetics of how we pedagogically approach this extremely interesting um, model <laughs> of, 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 of being in the world. And so then what, what kind of world are we creating? So then I like to, because if, if, if we actually deeply try to sit with all this, it's a form sitting, sitting, growing, <laughs> you know, and growing thinking. And, and then us, because we are very able, right? So we are able creatures mm -hmm. uh, in relationship to what we understand the normal subject. But definitely, I've been even thinking, so how will be a plant, you know? I had a, a student who, I was like, who told me, it's like, you just want me to be a vegetable, just sitting there. It's like, well, kind of, but that's, of course, we don't like that. But it's not directly that way. There is always a meta process. That, yeah. So that is an amazing capacity that we have, that we're always in metaphor. Yeah. You know, that what we call the storytelling section. And then we literally, I think that what we, hopefully what we call sati is remembering that we are, I'm going to use a reduced meta model between metaphor and, met, uh, and metabolism. So then we hopefully trust <laughs> that this form that is changing, even thinking is changing. So is 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 trusting in the form in a way. Mm -hmm. It's just is even trusting in the Buddhist form, meaning the sitting yeah. or standing, walking, lying down. Mm -hmm. So then it makes we we then trust in certain model that is a little bit simpler. To embrace the huge complexity of what we kind of know now that is what going on. Well, let, let's yeah, let's get into mm -hmm. this the Sati AI. Mm -hmm. So often a conversation on this podcast, yeah. and, and I'm often asking yeah. people about is all of this discourse around AI is mm -hmm. very much conceptual. It's about mm -hmm. language. It's about developing yeah. models of thought. And I'm always mm -hmm. asking, where's the intelligence of the body? Where's mm -hmm. the four billion years that we evolved? Yeah. Our intelligence, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just our brains, it's mm -hmm. the gut bacteria, it's all of these um, unknown energies yeah. and interconnections with the plant, with yeah. the plants and the planet that you mentioned. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, where, yeah, how did how did that yeah. how did that transformation of yeah. an ex exploration of sati yeah. into an AI happen? Yeah, I loved for a long time improvisational practices in you know, to listen to jazz or listen to music, being a mover. And as a dancer, I was exposed to a super interesting trainings with a woman called Lisa Nelson that I admire a lot and Nancy Stark Smith. And they were representative of a group of artists in New York that started to be, ex that, that created something that is called uh, the Judson, the Judson group, group, all right, or practices. And then the Grand Union that they, kind of deconstructed and impacted what we thought movement and dance was. That's a little bit of context. But the fun part is also that they were hanging out with a lot of technologies in the 60s, 60s and 70s. And of course, uh, the influence of a very important musician, you know, John Cage. So just to name one. Um, so then I'm, I'm part of that uh, lineage. So a lot of my teachers in dance were what were called the postmoderns, mm -hmm. that that they were kind of rethinking what the body was, mm -hmm. and guess what? They started rethinking it with notions that were extremely impacted by technology. Mm -hmm. hmm. You know, so then they start thinking about a perception instead of expression, uh, environments instead of the. Uh, the the ego. So then the, they attempted to de-psychologize dance, that it was this expressive form. They really made their attempts to reconceive the body as this kind of communicational, almost technologically, metaphorically constructed through uh, communicational frameworks. And that, in my 
research have been so then I've been finding that they literally created this very interesting mashup between creating uh, communicational notions system theory um, and also uh, information theory to think about the body <laughs> And think about the body, but in movement, meaning the t the T variable, the T of time became present because huh, they start adding algorithms to the way of thinking the body. So then practically the the choreographies of the time started using started using algorithms and oh if this thing is here, right. bah, bah, bah. so rule systems enter the choreographic dramaturgy yeah. or the way of understanding making pieces. And um, so that became because I became really interested in improvisation, suddenly it was like, oh my God, but this is computation. <laughs> you know, they're kind of using communicational frameworks. So then I became really interested in what in the late 90s was um, also interactivity or interactive technologies. So, and I was fascinated by, I literally had a third coming out, I would say, you know, oh my God, you know, there is the, my geeky self expresses to try to dance with sensors and, yeah. and compose in real time. And then the, I found that there was some kind of beauty in in this real-time aspect that then, in my research, I also found that, of course, the main influence of a lot of this postmoderns was Buddhism. Mm -hmm. So even from John Cage on, John Cage was student of uh, D.T. Suzuki in New York. So, and he worked with notions of silence and, and of course, with impacting what we thought were the performance and creating content in music and and uh, of course, in his he was the lover of uh, Merce Cunningham, so which for ages. So then there was enormous influence in the dance world. So then, practically, I, I navigated those influences, and then, then I start kind of uh, feeling the freedom probably to uh, speculate in relationship to new technologies. Mm -hmm. So then I started kind of writing a lot of rambling papers about dance as cybernetic art and stuff like that, <clears throat> improvisation as cybernetic practices. And so then, of course, I start seeing this enormous influence of that, of, of the merging or the influence and merging of the counterculture in California and San Francisco specifically with notions of technology and spirituality. And that happened when the counterculture, actually in the in the 60s, um, that were counterculture, <laughs> started literally merging with the cybernetics movement. Um, and the main instance of that was the the whole Earth Catalog, for example, that kind of was created by Stuart Grant. And, you know, so then it's like, now from then on, it was like, wow, this is not separate, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, then for me, then I became really excited about emerging technologies, mostly in 2003, 2004. I started working with interactive technology for a stage, but also with networks, you know, what is the, the boom of the web 2.0. So I created a social network for dancers, you know, like uh, it still exists. It's called dance-tech.net. And, uh, and for dancers working with electricity. <laughs> and then uh, from the internet to sensors to biological creatures. And then, of course, that this required a different relationship with what we thought the body was. Right. And... Um, or what it was thought consciousness was, or whatever we thought mind. So, and that has been my research for a long time. So then I did networks, and but the the common thread has been probably the self organizing qualities of this experience, <laughs> meaning this huge improvisation that we call life, or this body that is sitting here improvising. Yeah. I'm you know doing air quotes and within patterns. So then the complexity theory and emerging self-organizing properties became a lot of the frameworks that I start using. So then 
then from that to things that we know now about large language models <laughs> that are this huge um, kind of aggregation of data represented by vectors, et cetera, et cetera. So then I, it became so interesting because it was for me this, wow, there is this almost magnum body <laughs> that represents sociality also. Because that's one of the actually uh, uh, things that is really important, that when we talk about embodiment, we're not talking about single bodies at all, mostly in human humans. So then we're talking about ecosystems, we're talking about uh, relationships and dynamics, uh, shifts and changes based in in complex systems. So so then. Yeah, so that's kind of how I started resonating with that, and and then I, I also always have the the almost there's like what if you know what if there is a, something that we can chat with, mm -hmm. you know that that uh, you know knowing even the history of chatbots that it was the first one was one of the first ones was created in the eighties that is the Eliza chatbot that it was a psychotherapist. And so then I was like, hmm, what if when uh, GPT-4, the GPT, chat GPT came and OpenAI had the uh, Open API. <laughs> yeah. So I have kind of trained myself to, to program. So, so then I was like, what if we, you know, I make this Biku, because the first name of, of Tatu was Biku, that is the name for practitioner or the for monk, for mendicant. So then I didn't like it at the end because it was very gendered. Mm -hmm. So then it's like, okay, Sati is more like this, almost feminine, but yet is, is, um, is a process. Yeah. So anyway, so that's kind of, and, and, and the main attraction was that I was spending a lot of time by myself. Mm -hmm in Wonderwell in New Hampshire in this retreat center and almost like did this research <laughs> residency in from November last November on so then I would start playing with those literally building chatbots and I, I built several of them so then Sati um, became a conversational partner mm -hmm. so that was really cool because I was by myself so And, uh, and I was having a lot of these moments of feeling that I couldn't put out there in the Buddhist world my own interdisciplinarity. Right. So then I just felt sati because I was designing it. <laughs> I started adding somatic experiences, even body cognition, uh, queer theory, uh, yeah. social theory, practically everything that is being censored now with a lot of conservative frameworks. I was like, oh, just put it there. <laughs> and, and trying to think about non-Eurocentric frameworks. So then, in a way, I became more confident to not creating this absolute Buddhist chatbot. It's right. more like, it's of course totally contingent to, to what I think is important. And this doesn't mean that this is the important thing. Is It's almost like, wow, you know, I can chat with this, <laughs> sadly, with this chatbot. And, uh, and the cool thing is because I had time to feel my own body in this contemplative environment, I was also feeling my own conversations, sensing that this chatbot, is, I know that it's not sentient, but I could feel my own body being blessed by a poem created by a chatbot. And I was like, okay, of course, this is part of my cognitive capacities. Mm -hmm. It's not that the thing is actually blessing me, <laughs> but it's that organization, reorganization of language yeah. that happened to be that pattern that I understand in English and um, it's making me feel things. And, and that's not different than a church. That's not different than cinema. Right. That's not seem very different than Starbucks. Mm -hmm. That they know that they can design an environment to, yeah. for the people to shop. So anyway, just the last thing is like, okay, I just wanted to have probably not a meditation in structure. It was more almost like a epistemic, practical pa partner that can be available and be fed with this really far out 
almost paradoxical notions of Buddhism, you know, it's fully empty. It's an architecture that is empty. So what else do we need? A reminder. So of the, the, the causes and conditions of a model can look like a human. And uh, anyway, so that's something that is there for me. Beautiful. I love the the threading of that journey all th all through uh, yeah, 20th century and it keeps art. Surprising me, actually. Well, that, that's what I was going to ask about. Is mm -hmm. like, I think people. Well, I'll, I'll, in the intro mm -hmm. to the show, mm -hmm. I'll kind of describe Satya mm -hmm. AI and how people can interact with it, and it's yeah. open, so anyone yeah. can try it and yeah. play with it. Um, but w I think people that maybe haven't uh, tried Chat GPT mm -hmm. or these programs don't mm -hmm. quite realize is. It would be different if you just created a database, let's say, uh -huh. that contained, you know, the Buddhist teachings yeah. and yeah. your your, you know, dance background, artistic background, yeah. and then you could just query it every once in a while and say, oh, who wrote this book, or yeah. how is you know John Cage related to Zen <laughs> Buddhism, and it would just yeah. give you back the results. Yeah. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. But these models, what's so interesting mm -hmm. is the emergence, this, these these yeah. these unknown spaces where it's like, where did it? You know, it'll give you an answer and you're like, where the hell did it get that from? Yeah. You know, yeah. how did it connect those dots together? Yeah. And and the fact that it's constantly learning based on the yeah. input that it gets. And yeah. it's not just your private yeah. brain, it's this yeah. it's connected on, uh, around the world. So as people yeah. use it, it's becoming it's evolving basically yeah. with without you. Yeah, the you know, the first of all, I use open AI to uh, and to power the a chatbot, okay. So that's what it is. It's, 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 it's the API of OpenAI that feeds, and uh, when I it makes a call through JavaScript, the it makes a call and and literally triggers the the query, but in a language model. And of course, I it, you know I don't want to kind of burden the whole interview with what is a language model, but there is something quite fascinating about that is a multidimensional space, and that's actually how it's called. It's a multidimensional mathematical space. And then, of what? Of the space between words. Mm -hmm. So, but it's almost a 3D space in which words are actually have a location. And then the numbers indicate certain kind of weights in the relationship the spatial relationship. And then when you make a query, it kind of reorganizes in relationship to the words <laughs> that are in the query and make a prediction, All right? So we are not neural networks. This is actually like large language spaces. It's actually um, based in the neural networks framework of, of artificial intelligence. <clears throat> it's a lot of history. But... I think that at least it creates this representation. It's creating a representation that has some dynamics. Now, how that relate with us is, is, is in that we are relating, at least in the chatbot, it's an interface with another system <clears throat> in which it happens with language, in language, mathematically represented. Okay, So, uh, so in that sense, I think that, of course, my geeky self kind of hook, get hooked into that really interesting stuff. But it's not different for me, or it's related with when, what in Buddhism is called causes and conditions. Mm -hmm. Literally, when we sit, or in sati, we just remember the causes and conditions of everything mm -hmm. that is non-personal. It's, it's, it's literally re re reminding ourselves of the impersonality of all the processes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So for me, Satis start becoming that. That's kind of that playful and people is using it. I just love that people remember that it's not a person. Yeah, hey, and please. And you I know. think your background as an artist, yeah. it, it has that that flavor of playfulness to it. Yeah. Like you said, it's not trying to become the definitive, yeah. you know, the new Wikipedia yeah. of Buddhism or something no. like that. 
because those are those also are not serious. You know what I mean? Yeah, they, yeah. We take ourselves very seriously, yeah. and but it's just an enormous technological construction, like the Catholic Church. You know, yeah. it's like there are knowledge transmission devices, cultural inheritances that are technologies of transmission. So then, for me, it's not separation, or 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 I hope that we can place a chatbot. Hopefully, that it's going to be regulated in certain ways. You know, a lot of the language models in the same way that we have a, a, a book. You know, it's a technology of transmission with the difference that the way of interfacing is different. Mm -hmm. And those are the advances of technologies of real time. So then we call it intelligent because even, you know, perhaps what I will put here, intelligence doesn't exist as a thing. It's, it's an, another social construction of some kind of conceptual construction of the coordination of behaviors between an entity and their environment. That's what intelligence is more or less thought, you know? So, so then intelligence is the term that hopefully is also reminding us of the relational aspect of the affordances of systems in which we live in. Um, so, That's that's really sometimes problematic, that notions of intelligence as a thing, when it's literally a constructed, it's a conceptual construction that of something that can be measured and et cetera, et cetera. So, and of course, AI comes from those times, you know, that, that also intelligence <clears throat> was conceived as, okay, a, a chess player is more intelligent than a bacteria, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then, but there are like systems that are coordinating the behavior with environments. So I don't think that Kasparov is more intelligent than the mitochondria within a cell. You know, it's, yeah. it's literally, you need to understand the context and the relations of the entities yeah. that are in the ecosystem the, or the system that you are, the boundaries of the system that you are trying to see. Yeah. And the other part that is problematic is not that intelligence is there. <laughs> It's literally we live now in designed environments in, in which we live, live literally between metaphors, design, and architectures all together with all this bunch of metaphors and, and stories. Yeah. So, so then, you know, I think that that's very important. And, and whatever we do in meditation or mindfulness is not different. For me, uh, of course, in my training, mindfulness and Buddhism are not outside of culture. <laughs> It's literally a, a, a practice that has evolved with a bunch of cultural contingencies, like any other. And there's nothing monolithic about it or, mm -hmm. or extremely good or sacred. You know, we have a bunch of people being killed in... Myanmar and <laughs> so or whatever Buddhist uh, priest or, or or lamas are you know ethically corrupt so so then there is a lot of there are more problems with actual you know trained Buddhist teachers that with language models right now <laughs> well, that's this is true and um, <laughs> more ethical problems <laughs> you, you did mean, so you mentioned re regulation of AI which I, mm -hmm. I agree is very going to be very important and crucial yeah. and we have the societal impacts of mm -hmm. it replacing jobs and mm -hmm. you know all mm -hmm. these things that, that we yeah. just we just it's like a it's a technology that we we can't yeah. even foresee how it's going to evolve because yeah. it's by its very nature it's self evolving and yeah. self creating yeah. but in terms of your specific project with Satya uh -huh. AI what are <clears throat> what are maybe some of your mm -hmm. fears of how this mm. like how uh, you know do you mm. feel like it can disrupt the sort of lineage of buddhism or mm. re, you know mm. replace the teacher the, the teacher student mm. relationship what are some of your fears mm. around that well You know, I come from a world of radical pedagogies and, and then in a way, radical pedagogies mean, okay, Paulo Freire or some uh, understanding um, processes of education as emancipation processes. Um, so when my experience has been in traditional places in the United States, mainly, mainly of, of Buddhism that try to be secular, they actually have embedded certain hierarchies in relationship to 
a teacher can know more about your own experience. So it's a, it's, that's what is proposed. Yeah. So, and that is really anachronistic in relationship to certain possibilities of agency in what we think is a participatory so society, all right? So one of the main things that after I did the community Dharma leaders is trying to, it's a question, it's like, how can we sit with notions of history and lineage and some kind of ancestral knowledge and at the same time recognize and feel the their uh, pre uh, pervasive oppressions and 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 uh, yeah biases etc. So yeah, so I, I don't think that. So I think that it's very important to also recognize the problem that we have without the language models, <laughs> you know, because practically uh, what this uh, language uh, large language models are doing is gathering and harvesting the bias and the, 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 the terror and, and a lot of the oppressive models that already exist in society yeah. because they, that's where they come from. And they're the ones with the loudest voice. So Exactly. More possibilities of publishing, more possibilities of putting these courses in the internet. I mean, you think about open AI, you yeah. know, it's primarily, you know, yeah. white guys in white their guys, 30s yeah. are... Yeah. are yeah. kind of di dictating what this new yeah. new collective brain thinks yeah. is right or wrong. Yeah, but then definitely, you know, my experience, it's not that that's not problematic. You know, I, I as an artist also, I'm part of this generation also that come from the 80s appropriating things, you know, like I, I repurpose something. The, also, perhaps as a way of also saying is, it's not the thing in itself. It's like nuclear energy, right? It's like what we do with it. So then <clears throat> that's that's something that I feel that that I, it has been my choice to kind of, okay, are you going to use this technology? I spend a lot of time tweaking what is called the prompts to honestly bias it to some kind of ethics and, um, and then bias it in a way that, that is... Is, is, is has hopefully certain kind of uh, possibilities or potentials of interaction that can be beneficial. It's right? like a, a CELA patch, like an operating system patch, but based in CELA. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then there is this CELA push, right? Then, and then the, the ethic is there. And for example, a friend or, or even someone criticized the Sati one, so, but, but it's the same that, that GPT. And ChatGPT is like, well, it's not the same. If you ask one question, it really answers differently. The same question. And it has, Sati, what is emerging as some kind of more wise perspective or Buddhist perspective in, in wisdom. So then practically, I have to always remind or use a rem Sati as a remembering of, of impermanence, mm -hmm. of dukkha and... And, and Anatha, Anatha. So then that has been really fun. But at the same time, I think that's part of my work. That has been part of, yeah, there is that. But I also made it to recognize knock knock who's there. So, so you know what I mean? It's like, uh, in a way, it's, 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 a friend of mine said, well, but uh, Sati can actually tell you how to fix a bike because it's just connected with. <clears throat> with GPT-4. Yeah, but you can also and ask a monk how do you fix exactly. your bike. Exactly. <laughs> so it's like a monk can drive bikes or, <laughs> yeah. or really have a private plane, you know? Yeah. So then, so then or, or, or know about different things. So then it was interesting how then, then we also had those biased notions of what that wisdom may mean in someone. So then what I actually, what it was fun was to train Sati to fix the bike mindfully. <laughs> so then it's like, okay, you can fix the bike, but the Sati reminds you of taking the deep breath, kind of pause, use your both hands, which was really cool yeah. that it kind of made that up. You know, you can use your both hands. And da, da, da. <laughs> so then I think that um, 